Yep, I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, so, good evening, everybody. Uh, we will uh, start the Public Safety Committee. Uh, we have three bills that we are hearing tonight. Uh, the first one is uh, for banning face surveillance technology in Baltimore City. Uh, the second one will be human trafficking notice requirements, city owned and occupied buildings. And the third will be the Street Harassment Advisory Commission. Uh, we will first start with uh, banning face surveillance technology. I will turn the floor over to the bill sponsor and vice chair of the committee, uh, Councilman Burnett, uh, to give us an introduction. Uh, and then we will get into public testimony. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll get into agency testimony and then public testimony. Um, so go ahead, Councilman Burnett. Hey, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee and agencies and members of the public who've joined us today. Um, here to talk about the uh, proposed uh, ban on facial recognition technology uh, in Baltimore City. Um, there are a one, I would note that there's an amendment that all of you should have received. Um, which we believe addresses some of the concerns that the uh, law department uh, intends to raise um, around this bill. Um, but essentially, it, it does a, a couple things. Um, one, it, it, it bans the, the purchase of, of this technology uh, from city agencies. Um, so no city dollars to use this. Um, it also uh, extends that to the use of it uh, into private industry as well. Uh, I do want to note that it uh, creates some carve outs in the bill that relate to the use of uh, biometric data um, for entrance into a building or a private residence, which we are aware um, that some uh, private companies have the technology available for consumer use. Um, whether that be uh, doorbell cameras or um, cameras inside of the home, as well as government facilities uh, that use this technology um, to prevent uh, unauthorized access to their buildings. Um, and all of that is, is there. Uh, it it should, should be there, uh, in my opinion. Obviously, that's up for debate. But, um, but yeah, so the, uh, that, that's the, the key pieces of the bill. Um, a little bit on on why this is important. Um, oh, the other thing I would I would note. Um, sorry, before I move ahead, uh, I want to also note that in the, the law department will be here today um, to to speak on their report. But I, I want to uh, be very clear that in their report, um, it does very clearly indicate that this does not uh, impact the Baltimore City Police Department in any way, uh, and that is due to the fact that they are a state agency. Uh, and so the city council does not have the authority to uh, regulate the use of this technology um, within the Baltimore Police Department. Um, and, you know, want to put that put that on the record. Um, why this is important. Um, so this technology uh, has um, become incredibly controversial over the last few years as a number of uh, research, large research institutions, uh, MIT, um, uh, uh, Stanford University, um, number of, uh, there's a, a, a nonpartisan uh, government uh, agency, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, and many others have um, put this under the microscope around the issues uh, of, of disparate uh, policing uh, in, in, in the application of this in many police departments across the country. But most importantly, the, the studies have showed time and time again that this technology does not do a good job at, uh, at recognizing people of color, uh, particularly darker skinned women stand out in every single study that uh, has been put forth in the last year, in the year before, in the year before that. Uh, that there is implicit um, or bias uh, or, or uh, in these algorithms used for this technology, so much so uh, that even uh, in June of this year, just a, a few months ago, uh, IBM, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, which are some of the uh, leading and largest technology companies in the world, uh, have all announced 
that they will cease the sale of facial recognition technology to law enforcement agencies across the country due to racial bias in the algorithms um, and how the technology is used, um, which I think speaks volumes to the fact that these are not only large multinational corporations, but they all have a profit motive uh, and, and can make a lot of money uh, in using this technology or selling this technology. And so for them to take uh, such a bold step and take their own products off the market, um, it, I think speaks volumes to the very real uh, concerns that both civil rights organizations have raised across the country, as well as uh, civil liberties organizations have raised across the country. Uh, even the IBM CEO uh, said in a letter sent to Congress just a few months ago, uh, IBM firmly opposes and will not condone the use of this technology, including facial recognition technology offered by other vendors for mass surveillance, racial profiling, violations of basic human rights and freedoms, or any, any purpose which is not consistent with our values. Um, and, and I'll say that for me, that, that really stood out as a, a real rationale to be very incredibly cautious um, in what we adopt. And, and frankly, you know, the, the law enforcement trust within the community here in Baltimore City has been fractured for many of the exact same reasons that the CEO of IBM has laid out, that uh, how we have done policing in, in, in this country uh, has had a disparate impact uh, on people of color uh, through mass incarceration. Um, and that instead of uh, expanding the use of technology that we know has racial bias built into the code, uh, that that is a dangerous precedent for us to set, especially as we continue to see national protests all across the country uh, from the death of George Floyd, George Floyd or Breonna Taylor and, and so many others who've uh, lost their lives recently to then expand technology or the, the implementation of this, this type of technology that we know has racial bias uh, in the code itself, uh, which goes way beyond human intervention, um, is, is extremely problematic. Um, and I would uh, finally note that, you know, there have been national stories um, uh, from people who've been arrested falsely uh, or falsely identified or misidentified um, using uh, this technology, which has led to either passing of bans uh, or um, the exploration of passing of bans in several states and municipalities across the country, Portland, Oregon, Portland, Maine, New Orleans, Minneapolis, Utah, Pennsylvania, San Francisco, cities in Wisconsin, um, several California cities. The European Union has taken this up as well as the U.S. House of Representatives. And so I say all that to say that, you know, if the multinational companies that could very well benefit from the sale of this technology have ceased to um, offer this to law enforcement across the country. If other states uh, and, and, and national uh, governing bodies or international governing bodies are also taking the same steps, then I think it's important that the Baltimore City Council, uh, which has already passed legislation calling for a racial equity analysis, calling for um, and, and has conducted in its own committee uh, more increased oversight over the Baltimore Police Department. Um, you know, we, we are under consent decree for racial bias and to, to just continue in a, in a path forward in this way, I think is very problematic. Um, I do understand that technology changes rapidly and uh, this is something that could improve over time. But I, I would note that there is currently no regulation on the use of this. So while we would be waiting potentially to act um, on, on this, uh, we have an opportunity right now uh, as elected officials that can see that this is an issue that's been raised by large institutions, large corporations, activists uh, from all parts of the spectrum um, are, are saying this is incredibly dangerous, could lead to mass incarceration and uh, has a, a, a particularly bad impact on uh, people of color, particularly black women, then we can take a proactive step um, through this body to not wait until there is an issue that arises from this technology here in Baltimore City where someone's lives can be ruined, but to take a proactive step and say, this is not fit for game time, it's not fit for prime time, it's not time to use it. And if there's a reason to come back, 
uh, if that if the situation changes, then let's do so. But let's be proactive as legislators. And so I look forward to hearing uh, the testimony from all sides uh, and, and open to answering any questions that the members of the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, do any members of the committee have any questions for the bill sponsor before we proceed to uh, the agencies? No, okay, I'm just gonna ask one quick question. I'm not sure if we got an answer to this, but under this bill, would it also uh, prohibit Facebook from utilizing the facial recognition technology like they use to identify who's in pictures and things like that that we all see comes across our Facebooks? Uh, so I, I haven't had any communication with Facebook uh, indicating that this technology would inhibit that. Um, we so that would that would be for Facebook to to say that it's not the intention or my intention uh, as a, a user of uh, Facebook and devices that use facial recognition, uh, which is why we were very intentional in trying to pull that out of the bill. Um, your question also made me realize I didn't answer or didn't in my opening also address concerns that are likely to be raised by the police department that I want to be clear that for the record that my intention is also not uh, to uh, impact the current use of this um, by the Baltimore Police Department, which even though we don't currently regulate them, uh, it is in a, a very weird space right now uh, that I'll acknowledge politically. Uh, but we do know that the Baltimore Police Department does use a statewide database. Uh, this does not pull them out of the database. Um, and my intention for this is not to take any existing tools away, only to note that there has been a lot of red flags raised about this um, as it relates to the criminal justice system in this country and uh, encouraging us to be mindful of that as we move forward. Okay, maybe the law department can answer. Who's here from the law department? Uh, I am Mr. Chair, and this is Hillary Ruiz. Hey, Hillary. So just my, just to reiterate my question, my question is, according to uh, the bill, does, would this apply to the technology like what Facebook is using for facial recognition to identify, no. like if you were to post a picture and we're both in it, that it would automatically recognize that perhaps I'm in it? Well, I mean... It couldn't apply to Facebook because Facebook's not located in the city. So, I mean, this is only going to capture, the, you know, the city only has jurisdiction for laws that, that are within the city. So, it, so you're, it, right. Okay, that's confusing for a second. So you're saying, and I did not realize this, so you're saying this would only apply to city-based companies and not companies that are based outside the city, but their technology is being used inside the city? Right. I mean, this is just a general principle of law. I mean, the laws you pass can only be operative with, you know, and impact those people that that are subject to the laws of Baltimore City. You know, somebody in Oregon using this in Oregon, you know, it's not subject to to this law. So it can only impact those businesses and entities that are subject to the laws of Baltimore City. Like any other. It. Yeah. But all of us, all of us as you know, citizens of Baltimore City we have to abide by the laws of Baltimore City. So does that mean, so So, what are you saying as far as, like with the Facebook example, are we technically not allowed to utilize Facebook because it's going to cause us to, to break this law? I mean, I, I'm not no, following I, the way. I, I don't read it that way because okay. and it's, um, you know, it has to, perf uh, it's the, the bill excludes, um, you know, biometric security designed to protect against unauthorized access to a location or a device so we're we're already not you know we're not looking at the ones on our cell phones that you know if you turn that feature on and then the rest of it the, the bill talks about um you know um person can't obtain access or use and see a face surveillance system or information obtained from a face surveillance system um you know, I'm not reading that as saying you you couldn't use all the features of Facebook. You know, um, so how do we how do we not use that one feature unless they have an option to turn it off? So I guess I guess can you can you go back to if the company? So this would only apply if the company is located in Baltimore City and well, doing business in Baltimore City. Let's be clear: the bill applies to any person. 
So the the um, the person, whether it's a company, receiver, trustee, the the person has to be located in Baltimore City for your laws to apply. Um, you know, we don't we don't explain in any of the laws that you pass that they don't operate in Anne Arundel County. You know, so again, the person has to be located in Baltimore City. So this would not ban Facebook from operating as Facebook. Your question about whether a person can use a feature of an online software program that has uh, face recognition, that's a separate question. And as I'm reading this bill, face recognition does not seem to be the kind of thing that's captured in this bill. You could make that more clear if you want, but a face surveillance system is described as, you know, something that, that, um, is a assists in identifying or verifying an individual themselves based on physical characteristics my understanding of facebook is that's not generally what it does that it's not a it's not a computer or software application that is designed for face surveillance it's just that you know it, it could tag a, a, a person in a picture but my understanding of that is it's not necessarily based on their physical characteristics as much as it's based on the information you put into Facebook as who your friends are and things like that. You know, I think it's targeting, well, that, you know, it's targeting the, the computer that it's targeting the software. My understanding of this bill is it's targeting software that decides, you know, itself computer wise, who the person is. My understanding from Facebook is that you know those tags and pictures are based on the information you put in, not not really on the, some automated process. No, so that's 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 not that's not uh, completely how it works. I mean, if if I were to upload a picture of uh, of the Baltimore City Council onto my onto my Facebook page, um, whether even even if some of um, you know some people in the picture are not if i tag them obviously yes it will identify them but if i right. don't tag them it does it does still identify i know i've seen on you know on my on my facebook i've seen i've been tagged i've been uh recognized on things that weren't actually me um so it comes and pops up and and loops me in and says here you know you're in this picture even though i'm not actually in the picture so that face that's a facial recognition and that's identifying that. And so um, I guess if, if somebody were to use that technology or another technology like, uh, you know, Google has the reverse image searching, uh, which is a facial recognition uh, based on, you know, like images, what would, when does it apply and when does it not apply? Because if, well, if, if, I'm, if I'm in Baltimore City, you're saying I can't utilize, I can't utilize that technology but if um you know but for companies outside of the city they can go ahead and um you know and do that well i mean i think i think you're raising a good point if this is unclear to you then you definitely want to make it clear um, I, you know you one could argue that facebook and these other um online programs are are the type of face surveillance that's captured by this bill so if you want it to not be captured then you should make that you know more clear. Um, but yes, of course, it's only ever going to apply to people, you know, in its in its subsection 18-1D, the people have to be located in the city for it to apply. So can I So we're using a few def definitions interchangeably that are not all the same. So facial ver verification is what Facebook uses, and it only can use that after you have uploaded a image yourself or someone else has uploaded an image, and then it uses that to determine if it's a match. And this is used to unlock phones or to board planes, stuff like that. Uh, facial uh, recognition uh, uses can be used in real time video in an attempt to label other things, uh, personality traits, mental health, intelligence. Uh, it can also, they also have the ability to identify things like sexuality, political beliefs, uh, potential criminality, which is how law enforcement may use such a thing. Um, it, it, and then I would also note 
there's a third piece of this, uh, facial identification, uh, which can be used when they compare your face to a, a against a, a set of a database of faces. So driver license photos, mug shots, uh, is facial identification. And then there's also facial attribute classification where your face is analyzed and attempt to guess demographic, demographic attributes like your age, gender, ethnicity, uh, and, and they can also detect accessories like facial hair and stuff like that or changes in that. Uh, and so using what we're saying around facial recognition and facial verification are very, are two different things. This bill does not prohibit facial verification, uh, to access devices. And we have that in the bill already. Right. I mean, he's definitely right. Anything about facially um, using facial recognition to access something is definitely carved out. But I think, um, you know, Council Member Schleifer's question is more about, you know, can you what about features like on Facebook that that identify people? And my understanding of that was was, again, it, it wasn't the computer doing it as much as it was, com you know, it was like the person themselves tagging it. But if it's really the computer, and then I think you know you are best off clarifying what you want to to put forth in this law. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any um, members of the council or the committee that have any questions before we move on to agencies? I guess since um, since we had you, uh, Hillary, do you want to just go into your agency report? Sure. Um, our agency report's fairly simple. Um, it just points out really a caveat of what we were talking about earlier. The law can only apply to things that Baltimore City is allowed to legislate over. And that includes people that are in Baltimore City, companies in Baltimore City, but it could never capture um, state agencies or federal agencies. So again, the, the police department, as, um, as the councilman said, is a state entity, so it wouldn't apply to them. Um, and again, it's not going to apply to the federal government. So that was really the bulk of our report. And we suggested one amendment that I believe the council member had um, written up a legislative reference just to make um, a change in the um, law to reflect the fact that where it says right now governmental entity, that's kind of misleading. It makes it sound like it would apply to a state or federal government, but it won't. So just changing that to meaning an entity of the mayor and city council. So not all government entities, but just the city entity. And that's really the, the crux of the report. Understood. Thank you. Um, the police department, Colonel Briscoe or Michelle. Hi there, um, uh, uh, Chairman Schleifer, members of the committee, thank you for having us. My name is Michelle Wurzberger. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Baltimore Police Department. I am joined uh, this evening by a number of uh, members of our team. We do have Colonel Cherie Briscoe. We have Lieutenant Colonel John Herzog. We have Chief Woody Davis. Uh, we have, and we have Director Vaught. I believe uh, Deputy Chief of Staff Andy Smolian is milling around somewhere as well. Um, so I know that there's already been some conversation about BPD, but uh, I wanted to raise a couple of points. Um, first and foremost, uh, as Hillary mentioned, uh, and as Councilman Burnett, Burnett mentioned, right now the council is not permitted to <clears throat> legislate uh, for, against, or about BPD. Things could change. Um, and so we're really kind of looking at this legislation through that lens. Um, and in the bill report, we suggested some additional language that if the um, things should change and you are uh, able to legislate BPD, then this bill would, in fact, um, we would have to comply with this bill. And so we suggested some language that, um, that we think would make it easier for us um, and would rather uh, prevent a, a outright prohibition, but in, instead put in some safeguards to ensure that we are utilizing it appropriately. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it over to the team. Um, Colonel Briscoe is gonna speak first. She is going to kind of lay out um, how we use um, the state system that um, Councilman Burnett uh, alluded to, um, and then we will kind of uh, have a conversation about the protocols that we utilize currently to safeguard that information. 
Good, good afternoon, council. Good afternoon, chairman. Um, thank you for this opportunity to just um, levy some um, insight of the Baltimore Police Department and how we use um, this tool. Um, just as uh, Director Wurzberger just laid out, this tool is a state um, run um, um, tool for us. So this is the Maryland Image Repository um, is where we draw our, our, our images from. It has been available to us um, as a part of the MILE system since 2011. It is more than anything um, a digitized uh, photo book, if you will. If you remember the days of old when we had um, mugshots and large photos that were a manual process for um, investigators, they are photos that are, are, are brought in from the uh, MBA system, uh, Division of Corrections, uh, Parole and Probation, and, and the like, your arrest bu booking photo as well. Again, a state-run photo repository that we utilize with protocols in place. So our detectives will have, uh, when I say a clean image, a still image of an individual that is submitted for comparison. That process is submitted through the Watch Center to Director Vaught and his team. There are three analysts that are available that go through that, that uh, digitized photo book, if you will, and provide through a means of um, a validated number from zero to 999 and gives us a comparison point it involves human intervention. We do not use this um, digitized photo book, if you will, this near system as the sole means and only means to be able to effectuate any other part of our investigation. Meaning that we have to have human intervention to affirm identity of the person. We do not use it for a one for one. It is not making match to say that this is Cherie Briscoe. When that photo comes up, it gives us a point of comparison and there are human interventions that take place to affirm the identity of the photo that is given versus the photo that we are, are submitting. And it comes with um, specified information of that person. Um, again, the, the detectives use that along with every other tool. This is just one part of the toolbox for an investigation, just as you would um, for our license plate readers, LPR hits, it still requires us to go out and do detective work to do our investigations to be able to use that information. It is not something that we use solely apart from the larger investigative tools. And when we're doing this process of using um, photos to help affirm identity, we're doing that with protocols in place. So again, as I said, this is a part of the largest statewide system that is a system that we have to go through training for. We have to be certified for through the state to access that system. And once that system is accessed by the analyst or detective, it leaves behind your your own singular individual identification. So your own digitized uh, fingerprint is attached to you running that record, whether you're doing a traffic stop or whether you're doing facial recognition, that information is left behind as to who ran that information and more importantly, why you ran that information. And then though all of that factual information is given back to the detectives and then they're making a determination. But again, a statewide system that we go through certification for, you have to maintain an active log on and ID to be able to use that information. And then that information is um, used along with the, the larger resources to be able to do, use an, do an investigation. And so I will uh, pass this off to our technology portion of our team to kind of speak to software. Right, right, who, who, unless, unless do you want to, do you guys want to take questions from the committee and the council sure. or? Sure. Mm -hmm. or, or do you have somebody else who wants to weigh in? Uh, it doesn't look like he's, uh, it, it, he may not have anything additional to add. Uh, after the colonel, so we're we're ready for questions. Okay. Anybody have any questions for the colonel or Michelle? You guys can grill Michelle if you'd like. No. Go ahead, uh, Vice Chair Burnett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so a couple questions. Uh, so you mentioned that there are um, protocols for the use and a, a state mandated training. Are these protocols, are, is every law enforcement agency that uses this system subject to these, these exact same protocols when it comes to how it's used in investigation? So the system that I'm speaking of is, so MIRS is housed within MILE system. 
So the mile system that you go to annual training for, that you're giving a number for, that that is dictated within um, the protocols that the state mandates for us. Um, the gap, uh, perceivably for me, will be the facial recognition. I cannot affirm how the entire state uses um, that facial recognition. I can specifically speak to how we use it and the protocols that we have um, in place through the Watch Center at BPD because the detectives are sending that information to the analysts um, that are in Director Vault shop inside of our Watch Center to run that, um, to access that information. So if, if that's the case, then any, if, if, if cause I, I think we're, we now dipped into hypotheticals, which I think is unfortunate. If, if hypothetically the police department were to become a, a city agency, wouldn't those exact same state protocols still be in place and preempt any city law anyway? So the state protocols, so that, that Miles NCIC is a part of a, so the CIC is the higher level, the federal level access of information. Miles is a state level. We have to have a log on that is state generated. And so anything governing this system would be, it's a state one system. So all of these rules governing that state system are applicable statewide, not just to Baltimore City. Correct. But and so question. The, the question is, so then this would preempt, this, that would preempt any regulation from the city council as it relates to accessing that system. No, it, uh, and if I just might uh, interject for a moment, if the city council bans the use, the purchase, the um, uh, uh, of any type of technology that are the subject of this bill, we would then not be permitted to utilize it. The other kind of thing, um, I, I think that our chief technology- And, 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 and is, there, is there legislation that you can point to that would verify that? Because if you're saying that we're currently the only, the, 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 the Baltimore City is the only municipality that doesn't have local control. So it, it sounds to me like there are statewide regulations that all of the jurisdictions are subject to. Uh, I, I don't, I, I'm missing where that would, how that would change. Because we have pre, preemption exists whether you're a city agency or a state agency. The issue of preemption uh, supersedes if it's a federal preemption or a state preemption, it doesn't matter what we do at the local level. And, and, I, and I think Hillary sounded like you had yeah, maybe I was an answer just to that one way or the other. And honestly, the, it, if the state regulations per permitted every local police department and or required them to use it, then that would be one thing. But if the state regulations are just talking about what to do when you use it, then a local law could be able to prevent the use of it. So you have to see what does the state law do? I mean, state law, not all state laws preempt all things all the time. You have to see, does it intend to preempt the field or, or what does it do? Um, so just having a state set of rules about how to use it once you do go to use it wouldn't prevent a local government from restricting its local police department from even being able to use it. But if the state law were, of course, changed or it was made clear in the state law that that the the idea was that no local no local law could prevent this use, then you then you'd be you know then you'd be fine. I haven't read the state law, so I can't say wh which way it is at the moment. But again, this is hypothetical because right now it, it you know this local yeah, law doesn't. I mean, so and, the, and I would I would and I would note that I mean I think it it, it is somewhat distracting by BPD to take this position when this council passes laws all the time that at any point the state could supersede or concede power. I mean, these are all hypotheticals that are, are not the case right now. Uh, and I think the law department's position has been pretty clear uh, that this does not impact BPD. And if, if that were to change, I think that's where the legislative process comes into play, that if there are a, because my intention, again, I've, I've been very clear about this uh, in, in speaking about this bill, and I'm happy to do it again, my intention is not to take the Baltimore Police Department uh, away from accessing the system. But if we were to adopt, and, and Hillary, you're welcome to confirm this for me, if we were to adopt the proposed amendments from the police department that would put, hypothetically regulate a situation that doesn't exist, would that then run us into the situation where we're passing an ordinance or an amendment that would be directing BPD to do something that we can't tell them to do? Well, I mean, can, can I just interject? Sure. 
So uh, a couple of things, Councilman. So, uh, I, and let me just be very clear. We're not trying to be a distraction by any stretch of the imagination. We just want, we, we know that you are, um, that you have really good intentions uh, for this bill. And so we wanted to make sure that, you know, nothing would prevent us from doing what we need to do in order to um, protect the public. And so there's a couple of different things. Uh, one is there have been situations in the past where BPD has voluntarily participated or agreed to certain things uh, uh, with bills. We did it uh, in particular with Councilman Cohen and his, uh, his um, I'm sorry, the, the name of the bill escapes me, but I know it's about trauma. Um, and so that's one piece of it. The second piece of this is, you know, a lot of times we acquire technology through BCIT. So BCIT would be the lead in negotiating the contract and, and moving that contract through BOE. We may not be the lead on that. And so this bill then would, in fact, prohibit us from going that route in acquiring certain types of technology. All right, thank you. Um, Councilman Cohn, did you have, uh, oh, actually before, do you have a question for BPD? Um, you had your hand raised, so if you don't have yeah. a question. I'm going I'm to hold mine for later, if that's all right, Mr. Chair. Gotcha. Any other uh, members of the council have a, qu a question for a BPD? I, I have follow-up. Oh, of a different, uh, not to extend the conversation about what was put forth. So Councilman Pinkett has a different line of questioning. I, I had a, a different line of questioning as well, but I'm happy to continue to Councilman Pinkett. No, no, my, I'm really, I, I was just trying to hear a little bit more clarity on BPD's position. I, I'm still, I'm, I'm still not. Are, are we saying that this bill would prevent them from using the technology that they're currently using, or are, are we saying that it doesn't? I, I, I don't. I, if if that was made clear, I missed it. It just sounded like we weren't clear about that, and, that, and that's that's a critical piece. Michelle, do you want to answer that because you were just talking about that? So, so I, I think we're looking at this bill through a, a number of different lenses. So first and foremost, as Ms. Ruley has indicated, um, state law indicates that you all are not permitted to, um, to legislate BPD. So that's, we're just going to put that to the side, right? But there's a couple of other situations where this bill could, in fact, impact BPD negatively. First and foremost, if the state legislature, and I know we don't want to talk about hypotheticals, but I think we need to, given the climate, kind of think about what could happen um, and the unintended consequences of that. So if the state were to grant local control, this bill would be applied to BPD. So that's the second category. The third category is in terms of, and what I was just saying, in terms of acquisition. So oftentimes, we will acquire technology um, through BCIT. BCIT is the lead agency throughout the city for technology. We have to go through them, work with them to acquire certain types of, uh, excuse me, certain types of technology. And so if this bill is passed, then we can't do that any longer. So there's a couple to be, of to be clear, you can't. You would not be able to purchase this type of technology. I think you, you're you're sort of pausing at like we wouldn't be able to work with BCIT. You could, but I think. You could. But let's say okay. let let's say, Councilman, that there is a new technological product that is you know better that will help in uh, aid the crime fight, and um, you know we have. Put together all the protocols to safeguard and and whatnot. But if this bill passes, then we could not go through BCIT to purchase that technology. Michelle, sorry to get get pretty direct, but so the councilman's question he was asking does does BPD support this bill as it is? Yes or no? Not as it is now, with okay. amendments that were indicated in in our bill report. Gotcha. Okay, Councilman Pinkett, do you have any other do you have any other question for that, or you're good? Okay, I have, uh, I have one question and I'll come go back around if anybody else has a question, just show me your hand so I can see you. Um, Councilman Cohn, is that like a fake, like, 
I, I saw your hand go up. I don't know if you're holding your head up or if that's a question, but uh, I'm, I'll I'm come back around. I'm on paternity. You'll drag me in for this hearing. And uh, sorry, no, I, not at this time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to your questions uh, sure. at the end of this round, if you don't mind. I just have a, a quick question uh, for Colonel Briscoe. Um, it was it was said in the beginning of this that uh, this technology and the use of this technology um, could lead to mass incarceration. And I know that's something that was brought up, you know, in the um, you know, in our briefing on this, on whether or not, you know, this could lead to some of these consequences, uh, you know, that are the catalyst for the bill. So is there any any possibility that, you know, a bill like this, you know, if we don't do this, that somehow this technology will lead to mass incarceration? So, um, uh, Councilman, I, I heard Councilman Burnett's opening remarks, um, just speaking of some things that have, have occurred. I have not seen data or science that supports um, his opening statement. So what I can tell you is we've taken every step possible. Um, of course, there's always room for evaluation and growth to ensure that there's human intervention with the process. So we're not simply just taking the photo that comes back um, that the uh, analyst gives us and, and be able to say um, that this is indeed Cherie Briscoe. It gives you a scoring from zero to 999 that this is possible, but you have to evaluate if it, if it is Cherie Briscoe. This is one part of the investigative tool. So what I'm saying to you is we don't use this in a way that just simply takes, if my, if my photo is loaded, and then they're they're able to say from just from my clean photo that's submitted from a detective uh, to to the to the analyst. Yeah, yes, this is Sheree Briscoe. There is this. Look at these options. Is that Sheree Briscoe? And do the rest of the investigative uh, legwork to say so. So I cannot make the correlation between mass incarceration and this technology as it is today in terms of this um, the mirror system, a digitized photo book that is pictures that we're pulling from the for MVA system and from the arrest booking photo system and from parole and probation. Um, again, this technology has been around since 2011. I think that if this technology was going to weigh in in that way, and I'm speaking of the technology as it exists today, all that I can speak on, not the possibilities of where technology can take us, but as it exists today, I think that we would have seen that if that were a possibility of the technology and we did not have oversight or protocols in place. Um, and, and it is 2020, and we have not seen that. I hope that answers your question, sir. Yeah, that does. Thank you. And uh, I just noticed the time, and I guess time flies when uh, we're having fun because it's already 4:45. We have uh, two other hearings coming up, and so I want to make sure we can make it through um, the other agencies. I think there's two more left, and then I want to get to the public testimony because I know the public's interested. Does anybody else have a, a pressing question for BPD before we get to the other agencies? Well, you said you were going to go back around, Mr. Chair. So I do have more questions. Yeah, no, so I'm just asking if people have a pressing question now, or can we go back around after we hear from the other two agencies, which probably don't have much to weigh in on. You have something you want to you want to ask now? Yeah. So. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, how how okay so one i i would just i don't want to debate uh this but i would i would i would wager that there's also not any data or research that supports that this has not led to mass incarceration or could not either i think we're we're, we're all sort of swimming in hypotheticals this entire part of this discussion um i, I would i would ask though that it, does the agency um how, how often does the police department use, or in the last year, has, have you used the uh, current uh, state database? So uh, from the onset of my, Council, thank you, Councilman Burnett, for that question. From the onset, I, I said that, like, I, I can't speak to it. There's been no data or no science in that regard that I what was my statement. But I can tell you in 20, uh, and we used this, the facial recognition software 600 times in 2018. We used it 800 times in 2019. Uh, and thus far in 2020, we've used it approximately 800 times. So you're in, in, in using it increasingly um, over the last few years. Um, and the and is this data public? Is there a public disclosure of, of how often uh, it has been used and what the results or outcomes of that utilization was? 
I cannot speak to that. I don't know of any. Um, and I defer to any one of my peers that are on the call. And if, you know, you can look. if I may, Colonel, I mean, um, no, so there's no public disclosure. I mean, um, and I guess, you know, any type of, um, you know, probability match that occurs, um, you know, the the information in terms of uh, the ultimate result of that would be whether or not uh, the individual through other corroborating evidence is, um, you know, charged with with a crime the, the utilization of the technology um, has, has, has increased, but the scope of the usage of it has not. Um, it's more just in terms of helping identify uh, persons of interest or suspects in active investigations, uh, primarily around violent crimes. Um, you know, but in terms of us um, publicly disclosing that, um, you know, they're all for act open and active investigation. So uh, that that does not get disclosed to the public. It would come up, however, um, in terms of any type of hearing uh, for any case, though. So it's it's not as if, you know, it's used and then, um, you know, swept under the rug throughout the course of the investigation. And since it is part of an investigative step um, and it is utilized um, through the course of any open investigation, um, you know, in, in conjunction with any corroborating evidence, once it even makes that next step or transition, um, you know, those investigatory, investigatory steps would be reviewed in systematic order um, and it would come up at that point. And last question, uh, how often is this database audited uh, to, in, to show uh, correct matches, incorrect matches? How often are, are your, so you, you mentioned that, you know, 10 months into the year, you pretty much it sounds like you're going to eclipse the utilization of this from last year. Um, how often when pulling a or comparing photos from the stated database to the one that you have, have you has the agency found that the threshold for accuracy uh, caused them not to use it moving forward? So you just made reference and I want to I want to clarify what I'm hearing to make sure I'm not missing. You're saying how often do we use the state's database versus the one that we have? No, 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 the, the state database. So one, the, the question is, what I'm really trying to, to get at here is, if, if you use the database and your analyst determines that information is not correct, where is that or is not enough of a match? How often does that happen? Uh, Director Vaught, do you have that information at your fingertips? Um, I, I, unfortunately, Councilman, we don't track it like that, but in terms of false positives and um, that type of technological auditing that since we don't, uh, we aren't the administrators or the operators of the technology, we don't have the, that ability to be able to audit that on that scale. Um, once we get more, I think, robust 21st century systems in terms of being able to kind of track things like that in a more sophisticated way. That is absolutely something that I think we should be doing just from like a performance management perspective. Um, but uh, currently as it sits right now, we do not track it, I think, in the way that you're describing. So, so just to summarize, the, the, the agency doesn't know how often the existing database is audited for accuracy, and you also don't track how many false positives you get using the system. So, uh, currently, and in terms of the, um, you know, how often the system gets audited for its technological fidelity, uh, that would be a question at the state level. Um, I just, I have no knowledge in terms of the administrative uh, oversight that the state has related to this specific technology. And, and internally, you also don't track false positives that the agency comes, comes across in using the, using the existing database. You don't track that. So, so let me can, can let me qualify false positives. So let me be clear: when the, when we're getting back information, it still requires human intervention. So if there if so, what you're asking is whether or not we use that information from the database to say if indeed this is Sheree Briscoe. Once we look at, is that what you're asking? Because the same. Well, I'm asking if you if there's if you officers through the human intervention determine that the database is inaccurate or that the person that it's saying is a match doesn't meet your internal threshold, do you track how often that happens? It's a, is there a yes or no? 
No, uh, according to no, we do not. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Um, I see uh, Liam here, do you have anything from DOT? Mr. Chair, uh, DOT stands by its bill report, which is no objection. Um, you know, within DOT, the division most likely to be impacted by this legislation would be our ATVS division, which is the division where our automated camera program is uh, operated out of. Um, to date, none of our cameras use facial recognition technology. Um, speed cameras and red light cameras, you, uh, you know, they're searching for um, license plates and their vehicle over uh, oversized vehicle cameras for trucks. They're looking at vehicle height. So um, there would be no impact on DOT at this time. And do you project any impact later on or? Um, there could be if the state authorized something like, um, you know, I think there's texting while driving cameras out there. I'm a little fuzzy on that, but I don't even believe that's been authorized by the state of Maryland yet. Um, so nothing in the immediate future uh, would be would be impacted. And you know, I think the bill includes an exemption for you know security systems on te technological devices um so you know we have a number of like pretty much all of our employees have smartphones so with that exemption there's really no impact gotcha and so i, I guess i missed the correlation the the uh, cameras that are texting while driving mm -hmm. that identify an individual and an individual texting um are you saying that that perhaps could be impacted by this it, it you know i'm not a hundred percent sure on that and again it's not it's not a it's not something that we currently operate and i'm unaware if, if the state is I, I don't to my knowledge the state has not authorized such a camera but you know in order to to operate a camera like that it would it would have to capture someone's you know face and then actually capture them on their phone um the technology to me on that front is a little fuzzy, but if need be, I can always follow up with the committee and ask our ATVS division to provide more information on that program. That that might not even specifically be impacted by this bill. It could just be a picture of someone's face rather than the actual facial recognition technology. Gotcha, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions for DOT? No, All right, I think the last one we have here um, is housing. Um. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is uh, Matt Stegman from uh, Mayor's Office. I, I don't believe that uh, DHCD was assigned this bill. Uh, okay. I, it, it was assigned to the. Oh, I'm, I I'm sorry. Steph. I hear Steph Murdoch. Yeah. Hi. Uh, this was not assigned to us. I'm just listening for the uh, other hearings today. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, I saw you listed on and the list. Uh, changed around so you disappeared on me. Okay, Matt, do you have anything to add from the mayor's office? Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, th this bill was assigned to the uh, mayor's office of criminal justice. And I, I do apologize, Director Govan had an unavoidable conflict and wasn't able to uh, attend this, this evening. Uh, the only thing that I would add um, is, is just, uh, I did confirm this with Deputy Chief of Staff Schnitzer, but as far as we're aware, uh, there are not any, uh, any entities outside of the uh, use the police department already explained of uh, any city entities uh, using technology that would be at present that would be prohibited by this bill. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, now, and if, if the committee doesn't have any questions for any of the agencies, I'd like to move on to public testimony uh, so that we can get on with the hearing. Um, mm -hmm. Mr. So, Chair, can, uh, I, can I ask a quick question of the law department? Oh, sure. Go ahead. I, I just was curious. So, um, are, are we able to, through legislation, um, prevent um, a particular? Are we able to um, dictate how city money is spent or used? Like, for example, in this scenario, could could, could the law prevent any city dollar? from being used? Uh, that's a great question, Councilman. Not really because the way the, the public local law for say the police department is set up, um, it's allowed to purchase whatever it wants. It has control of the, of the 
of the what it's purchasing, but the way it's set up, it has to go through the city's certain city board of estimates procurement process. So the, the short answer is it it would depend on each and every entity that's looking to purchase and how the laws are structured about how it uses its money. Like, for example, the school system, you know, we do give them a contribution of money every year and in, a, in a, you know, an annual, um, you know, maintenance of effort, but we can't direct what they spend it on. So it, it just depends on how each entity is is structured. Same with the state's attorney's office. We have to pay their salaries, but we can't necessarily. So it, just, it sort of depends on how the state law is set up for each entity, if that makes sense. It, it does. Oh. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, now we will move on to public testimony. Um, first person to uh, testify will be um, Joy, if you can um, introduce Bola yourself. Mooney? Yes. And, um, Absolutely. Sorry, can you say that again? Bola Mooney, like a bowl of lamb weenies. Bola lamb weenie. Uh -huh. Look, people mess up my last name, and it's a lot easier than that one. So I didn't—I didn't even want to go down the road. And I have an Ann Joy, okay. so so it's a lot easier to say Joy. So uh, go ahead um, with uh, with your testimony. Thank you so much, all of the members of the committee, and also Councilman for the opportunity to testify today. I'm the founder of the Algorithmic Justice League, but more to the point of this hearing, I'm an expert in algorithmic bias in a facial recognition technologies. I've conducted MIT studies that have shown the largest recorded gender and racial biases in AI systems sold by companies, including IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon. All three companies committed to stop selling their facial recognition technology to law enforcement in some capacity, as was uh, stated earlier. So I'm here in support of banning face surveillance, the use of facial recognition for the verification or identification of an individual as part of any kind of surveillance system. So we're not talking about Facebook here. My position follows the recommendation to suspend current and future private and governmental use of facial recognition technologies in all circumstances known or reasonably foreseeable to be prejudicial, which was uh, recommended by the ACM's uh, policy committee. Now, the ACM is the largest computing society. Why I'm bringing this up is the people who create these technologies, the researchers who are developing these systems themselves are saying we have to press pause, which is why I'm here. So have you, as you heard earlier, facial recognition has major civil rights implications, which others will speak to. What I'm here to speak about are the technical limitations because they can further amplify harm to Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color, women, elderly people, youth, trans people, gender non-confirming individuals. Basically, if you have a face, you have a place in this conversation. Even in one test I ran on Amazon's AI, right, they failed on the face of Oprah Winfrey labeling her male. I personally had to wear a white mask to have my face detected using some of these technologies. Now, given the implications of mass surveillance, not having my face detected could be a benefit. But we don't need to look to China to see that this kind of technology is already being used for the surveillance of protesters with little to no accountability and often in violation of our civil rights, including First Amendment, freedom of expression, association, and assembly rights. So when the technology works, we cannot forget about the cost of surveillance. In other contexts, failures can be harmful. Misidentifications can and have already led to false arrests and accusations. This summer, we learned Robert Williams was wrongfully arrested in front of his two young daughters due to a false face recognition match and detained for 30 hours. As a black man accosted by the police, we know that the outcome could have been fatal. And still, the consequences of misidentification are indelible. He's not alone. In April 2019, Brown University Muslim senior was misidentified as a terrorist suspect in Sri Lanka Easter bombing. She wasn't even in Sri Lanka. The police eventually corrected the mistake, but she still received death threats. Mistaken identity is more than an inconvenience. They are not alone. There's been so much talk about not knowing what the numbers are because in the U.S. there's no requirement to disclose it. 
In the UK, the faces of over 2,400 innocent people were stored by the police department without their consent, and the department had a reported false positive item to vacation rate of over 90%. So where we do have some kind of transparency into the numbers, they're not good. In the US, there's largely no reporting requirements. So of course we don't know because we're not checking, we're not looking. Further, these tools do not just have to identify a unique face to be harmful. An investigation of IBM showed that they equipped the NYPD with tools to search for people in video by facial hair and skin color. So in short, you can use these tools to automate racial profiling without even having to identify a unique individual. So it was heartening when IBM came out to denounce the use of these technologies for mass surveillance and profiling, right? They are no longer selling or developing facial recognition technology, uh, period, which is a major statement. Due to the consequences of these failures, I focused my MIT research on the performance of facial analysis systems. I'm concerned because of what I have learned through empirical analysis. I found that for the task of binary gender classification, IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon had error rates of no more than 1% for lighter skinned men. In the worst case, these errors soared to over 30% for darker skinned women. This was especially surprising because we're talking about binary gender classification. You have a 50-50 shot of getting it right by just guessing. When we're talking about using face recognition for identification, the chances of getting it right are so much smaller, which is why I suspected once these systems were actually tested, we would find even more bias. And this is what did happen. So subsequent government studies actually show continued error disparities. The latest report, right? So you, people try to say this is outdated. The latest report, 189 algorithms, 99 companies, the majority of the facial recognition space, they revealed consequential racial, gender, and age bias in many of the algorithms tested. And one of the key findings, right, from this most recent report from nonpartisan National Institute of Standards and Technology, false positives were often 10 to 100 times higher on African American and Asian faces than on Caucasian faces for one to one matching. The report on 189 algorithms also showed that for one to many matching, the team saw higher false positive rates for African American females. So the data is there, the science is conclusive. We continue to have study after study after study showing these accuracy disparities. But even if these error rates improve, the capacity for abuse, lack of oversight, and development limitations pose too great a risk. Given known harms, the city of Baltimore should ban the government use of face surveillance and demonstrate leadership alongside cities like Portland, Boston, San Francisco, and a growing wave of more than a dozen that have already done so. So again, if you have a face, you have a place in this conversation. We have a voice, we have a choice, and we choose not to live in a society, right, where your hue is a cue to dismiss your humanity. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Joy. Um, we have uh, two more people on this uh, for um, public testimony. Eric Williams, are you with us? Eric Williams. Uh, I want to see if. Let me see if I can. Uh, he was Let me see if I can find him. Yeah, if you can unmute him, he's in the uh, attendees. Uh, hang on, hang he on. He was, he was elevated, Mr. Chair. But let me, let me see if I can find him. He, he's, he's there, muted. If you just unmute him, then he can testify. Yeah. Okay. Hang on. Yeah, he's, uh, he just commented that he's here also. Uh, Eric, Mr. Chair, I had a quick follow up for uh, the last speaker. If you, is it okay if I throw that in there, or do you want it to wait for everyone? Um, I mean, it's probably quicker if we waited, but uh, while he's elevating Eric, you can go ahead. Uh, it was just a quick follow up. Uh, one, thank you, Joy, uh, for both your research. My apologies that you were uh, the, the, the MIT study that I referenced were your work. Thank you for that. Um, and it's been a lot of time on your website diving through all of the, the research uh, in preparation for this. So thank you for, for leading on that. 
I did have one quick follow up for you. You mentioned, um, I want to say it was the UK uh, does have reporting. Can you speak to the type of, and this is sort of in the line of question I was asking the police department was because there isn't any reporting or public disclosure um, in, in, in the, the system that they already use. Uh, can you speak to what is being done in other countries as it relates to the tracking and this public disclosure of uh, this, this technology and its use? You're muted, you gotta unmute you. We gotta unmute you, hold on. Okay, back on mute. So in the UK, they track false positives. They track false negatives. In fact, they had a, a, a university do a human rights assessment on the use of the technology in the first place, and they found that it was in violation of human rights. And so what they were able to do by actually tracking the numbers of the system is they're no longer operating in the dark, right? And so this is how they were able to say, okay, more than 2,400 people have had their faces um, uh, stored without consent. This is how they were able to to say, okay, there's a 90% uh, false positive match rate because they were actually tracking. When we're operating in the dark, we don't know. It could be it works well, but what we actually see when the numbers come out is that <coughs> there is continued uh, disparities. And it's also not so surprising that the people who are stopped more often were darker skinned individuals. Research from the Maryland test facility here, the biometric test facility, they specifically looked at skin reflectance, right? Lighter skin, darker skin. Darker skinned people, worse performance slower times, all of that. So the research is there and it continues to compound showing that there is persistent and existing racial bias, gender bias, age bias with these technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Joyce. Right. Um, Eric, Eric, are you unmuted? Yes. Okay. Can you tell me? Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. Okay, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you. Uh, having me here today. Um, I want to thank all of you for that. Um, my name is Eric Williams. I'm a senior staff attorney for the Economic Equity Practice of the Detroit Justice Center, uh, a nonprofit legal services organization that works with Detroit communities to address individual and systemic barriers to economic and social justice, including the legacy of mass incarceration. So what I'm here to do today is share with you the serious concerns raised by the use of facial recognition in Detroit is part of a surveillance program called Project Greenlight. Now, uh, Detroit's my hometown, and it's a place where uh, residents have very real concerns about safety. And those concerns were why people were open to Project Greenlight to begin with. Uh, it's a public-private partnership that deploys high-definition surveillance cameras and across the city and streams the video directly to the Detroit Police Department. Now, this program was presented to the public as targeting a specific problem, namely that 25% of violent crimes in Detroit, including carjacking, occurred within 500 radial feet of gas stations. And this is largely because, uh, one, we don't have public transportation, two, the gas stations serve as frequently as supermarkets in what are essentially um, food deserts, and there were some of the few businesses open after 9 p.m. in many neighborhoods. So. PG, uh, Project Greenlight began in 2016 with eight gas stations, and immediately afterwards, uh, the mayor and the chief of police hailed it as an unqualified success. And so the two really important points I want to make here. The first is that after four years of operation, there's no evidence whatsoever that Project Greenlight has reduced crime at gas stations or anywhere else, right? Despite this, the city has committed more than $15 million in public money to the system, money that could have been spent on proven public safety measures or public services. The second thing I want to say is that it's a really important point is that facial recognition was not originally a part of Project Greenlight. Um, but surveillance projects seem to have a seem to have a life of their own. And with no public accountability, Detroit police use facial recognition for more than a year, literally, and I mean like old school, literally, with no specific policies or procedures governing its use in place, right? When the police department finally proposed a policy and brought it before the Detroit Board of Police Commissioners, which is the civilian body charged with police oversight, it was just three pages long. Naturally, people were very upset about this. There were massive protests. 
and eventually a more comprehensive set of policies and procedures were presented and approved by the board. But these policies and procedures don't have the force of law and they amount to a little more than just like a pinky promise that DPD will behave well. Um, there's no transparency and absolutely no accountability. So it's probably not surprising to you. And in fact, uh, Joy mentioned it, uh, there have been false arrests based on facial rec faulty facial recognition identifications. Uh, there's Michael Oliver and uh, Robert Williams. All the charges against Michael were dropped, but he was held for three days. And as a result, being taken out of his life for three days, he lost his job. Uh, all charges were also eventually dropped against uh, Robert Williams. Uh, but as Joy noted, he was arrested in front of uh, his two young daughters, was held for 30 hours, and then released finally after posting a $1,000 bond. Right. The only reason we even know the role that facial recognition played in these wrongful arrests um, is because the arresting officers casually mentioned it. We have no way of knowing if there have been additional arrests. And we have absolutely no way of knowing what real um, controls have been put in to prevent it from happening again. DPD says that um, Michael and Robert were arrested before the current policies were adopted. Um, they admit that the police work underlying it was shoddy, and they say that these were isolated incidents. But none of that's really comforting. Um, I don't think there's really any need to further address uh, what Joy covered and the obvious problems that arise from having uh, a system known to disproportionately identify Black people in a city that is 80% Black. Though I have to say I'm a little curious as to whether or not people would believe this technology was ready for prime time if the description operated the other way. Uh, what I really want to draw your attention to are the dangers of creating a surveillance infrastructure lacking any established legal constraints, particularly protections for Black, Brown, poor, LGBTQ, and other vulnerable communities. As with police use of wiretaps, fingerprints, and DNA, law enforcement adoption of facial recognition technologies leaps and bounds ahead of the laws to prevent its abuse. Uh, judicial clarification of the boundaries of our civil liberties vis-a-vis -vis facial recognition lags even further behind and this state of affairs is on full display in detroit since january of 2016 when project green light went live it's grown from eight gas stations to 700 plus sites and these include a variety of local businesses public schools churches reproductive centers housing developments and public spaces the cameras available to dpd now include drawings dro drones and ring cameras and the program's, program's rationale has shifted from capturing criminals in the act to deterrence to apprehending suspects after the crime. But despite this really rapid expansion in mission and capabilities, local oversight is non-existent. The Detroit Police Department has not disclosed the system's underlying algorithms, confidence score parameters, or the priorities that set them. There are no enforceable rules regarding the quality of the photos in the enrollment database, which, by the way, has more photos than Michigan actually has residents or the photos that are used as probe images. Detroit has refused to educate the public on how facial recognition works. And until like very recently, in the aftermath of these wrongful arrests, it basically presented it as an infallible black box for crime prevention. There's no input, public input into the deployment of cameras. There are no specific criminal penalties for abuse of the system. There are no limitations on access to the system by state or federal law enforcement agencies, including the FBI and ICE and DHS. And there are no clear avenues of redress for those harmed by this technology's failure, like Michael and Robert. Um, an ordinance to limit this has been in front of Detroit City Council for more than a year with no action. And there's been a similar failure to regulate the use of facial recognition at the state and federal levels. Bills to restrict and prohibit law enforcement use of facial recognition technologies have stalled in the Michigan House and Senate. And it's even worse on the judicial front. Courts have only recently considered facial recognition's privacy implications in a commercial setting. Case law use in law enforcement context is virtually non-existent. It is entirely unclear to what degree the constitutional protections we take for granted, particularly with regard to due process and the right of association, will apply in a facial recognition context. It would be a mistake to presume that rights such as those related to probable cause and privacy will extend to policing rooted in facial recognition. In fact, it's actually more likely that the typical judicial def deference to law enforcement will make the technology a shield against police accountability for arrests and searches conducted without uh, probable cause. 
You don't need to imagine potential for abuse, right? We've got COINTELPRO, Ghetto Informant Program, surveillance of Muslims in the aftermath of 9 11, uh, FBI and DHS monitoring Black Lives Matters protests and individual activists. Like, try imagining the 1960s if the police had possessed the technology to scan crowds for protesters with outstanding warrants or who were uh, wanted for questioning. In short, it's not a question of if this technology will be used to stifle legitimate free speech, but when. Just as troubling, facial recognition amplifies existing biases in our criminal justice system because the creation and deployment of facial recognition systems cannot be separated from the existing racial, social, economic, and political power dynamics in our system. Right now, predominantly black neighborhoods are simultaneously over-policed when it comes to surveillance and social control and under-policed when it comes to emergency services. The deployment of facial recognition in black communities amounts to a virtual stop and frisk without any of the constitutional restrictions. And whether we're talking about NYC stop, style and frisk, and as somebody who lived there during this, that kind of sucked, uh, or it's virtual equivalent, this impacts innocent residents and it undermines all the goodwill uh, in police and community relations and ultimately complicates proven public safety measures. Now, in conclusion, I understand that facial recognition appeals to cities and law enforcement. It's a shiny new crime fighting tool like drones or military surplus. But, in place, but once in place, surveillance infrastructures are virtually impossible to dismantle. In Detroit, the financial and political investment in Project Greenlight has precluded any evaluation of the program's actual effectiveness and rendered civil liberties an afterthought. Now, I don't know at this moment how much control Baltimore has over this, but before you even start thinking about this road, you should understand that without effective legal protections and an honest evaluation of existing biases in your criminal justice system, the adoption of facial recognition technology by law enforcement is not a silver bullet for crimes, but rather an amplifier of our worst tendencies, the obstacle to meaningful criminal justice reform and a threat to our civil liberties. So um, thank you very much. And I'm certainly happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Uh, thank you very much for that. And I guess, as you probably heard in the beginning of the hearing that, you know, those kind of things being that BPD is, um, is controlled by the state, um, that would obviously need to be done on a state level, but, um, thank you for your testimony. Um, it's called, uh, Richard, have you, um, can you unmute, uh, the next, uh, it's Shia Parker, she's unmuted. And then next, next up after her is Jake Parker. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Just good start. afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Committee. Um, my name is Ashia Parker, and I'm the Executive Director of No Boundaries Coalition. For those who do not know us, No Boundaries is a resident led advocacy organization building a unified and empowered Central West Baltimore across the boundaries of race, class, and neighborhoods. We mobilized residents from seven different neighborhoods in Baltimore City to challenge the culture of and issues created by segregation. Um, our cross-neighborhood relationships build political capital and mobilize residents to address issues together. Um, currently, we are advocating in our neighborhoods for gun violence prevention, closing the digital divide, giving more opportunities to young people, and increase in civic engagement. We also mobilize food access in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. After the death of Freddie Gray, No Boundaries Coalition had a robust, a robust police accountability program, which had influence on the federal consent decree. I also stand before you today as a commissioner on the commission to restore trust in policing. Um, the neighborhoods that we serve are pretty diverse. Um, we have both, um, I like to call them more affluent neighborhoods and more struggling neighborhoods. However, all of our residents are full of love, culture, and our families fight for Baltimore City every day. Um, many of our residents feel like we're forced to choose between wanting safer neighborhoods and possibly giving the rights or compromising the rights of the safety of our community members, um, especially black men. We understand that there's pressure on BPD to reduce crime, 
and particularly violent crime throughout the city. Um, we appreciate the use of technologies like the aerial surveillance aircraft and being able to apply facial recognition algorithms to grow the tools that police are using, but we're not sure that we are there yet um, for our implementation. I just concur with the statements of Ms. Joy and Mr. Eric that there's data to support that these technologies are not ready um, to be used here in Baltimore City. Um, there's no evidence that they reduce crime, especially violent crime, and there is evidence that they target and misidentify black and brown citizens at a higher rate. Um, more to that point, the commissioner has, ma has made more community-based constitutional policing efforts throughout Baltimore. Um, until we can truly rebuild trust in our communities, um, in our neighborhoods, we are not going to be successful in reducing crime if we use technologies that the communities just do not trust. Um, I was told um, by other advocates that BPD requested $80,000 in support for the use of note, Lotus Notes. Um, we were, the community was under the understanding that BPD was moving um, in a way to modernize more um, of its management and technology. Um, just some of these like misunderstanding of what the police department is actually spending money on and actually investing in um, makes the community kind of, you know, weary of its choices in the technologies that they use. Um, also, there has not, there's really no policies that would ensure that there would be community oversight on how these technologies be, would be used. Um, so for me, until BPD can be totally transparent about how the data will be used and tied to cases, I don't feel confident about the use of facial recognition software in Baltimore. Um, there is fear that this technology will be overused in black and brown neighborhoods as many policing techniques are. Um, like I said, there's, there is a duality in communities because communities want their their streets safer and they want um you know the police department to be able to do their job but we just are not um ready to sacrifice our civil liberties to do so um with that being said i am dedicated to working with city legislators and bpd to find new ways to police our neighborhoods that will protect the safety of our residents, even if those residents are suspected of wrongdoing. Um, so that is my testimony. I definitely wanted to put something on the record from the community perspective. Um, I thank you, Councilmember Burnett, for bringing this issue to light. Um, and thank you again for allowing me to testify. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rafia. Uh, for all your hard work at uh, No Boundaries as well. We greatly appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right, Richard, if you can go through one by one through the attendee list. Okay, Jake, Jake Parker had his hand up. He's on mute, so he can go ahead. Jake Parker. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the council. I'm with the Security Industry Association. We're a trade association located in Maryland representing uh, security solutions and technology providers. Uh, including many of the leading providers of facial recognition technology. Uh, we have some concerns about the proposed ordinance. Uh, a, a, and a ban is an extreme measure uh, that we think is unnecessary and it's not in the public interest. I think contrary to what uh, we've heard earlier, this is not a proactive step. The technology is not just around the corner. It's been used successfully for years. For over a decade in law enforcement and in many years in the commercial sector, we've even used this in our own offices for the last five years. There are many benefits and thousands of success stories, including the well-known case where it was used to identify the Capitol Gazette shooter two years ago. 
A ban on the technology precludes the opportunity for us to enact policies to make sure the technology is only used for appropriate and acceptable uh, purposes. Applications of facial recognition are extremely varied, uh, and, and it makes more sense for policies to be application specific so that we can avoid eliminating long-standing beneficial uses. So if the concern is that a some kind of surveillance apparatus could be built, for example, which we would not support, uh, a mass surveillance by the government using the technology, then let's uh, work together to enact policies to make sure that that doesn't happen. The bill's definition of face surveillance uh, would include nearly all applications of facial recognition technology, regardless of whether it has anything to do with surveillance. And I think this would encompass many beneficial and non-controversial applications. It's entirely too broad. There shouldn't be any confusion that facial recognition technology is used by a Facebook application that we discussed earlier. Uh, they're in the process of trying to settle a lawsuit in, in, in Illinois over this very issue having to do with biometric data. So I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, and unfortunately, we've spent a lot of time here talking about the uh, about law enforcement, but uh, included in a, in a draft ordinance is a complete ban on private sector uses of the technology. This uh, would allow the types of things this would prohibit would be allowing customers to prove their identities to conveniently and secure, securely make banking transactions, uh, customized services in the hospitality and gaming industries, and additional security measures at entertainment venues and, and other types of facilities. Businesses and individuals in Baltimore City would face criminal penalties uh, through fines or imprisonment for uses in everyday business operations. And I, I, we think this kind of type of intervention in commerce and in pub, private property uh, demands a, a very strong and, and a more thorough justification. Um, you know, I, I think you know the draft ordinance reflects a real concern that law enforcement use of the technology could possibly neg negatively impact women and minorities. Uh, but there's no evidence that this technology has contributed to the racial profiling and other systematic issues of concern in the police reform and criminal justice reform areas, very important areas. But we're not seeing evidence that has contributed to those underlying issues. And we, the council should consider that banning the technology would actually eliminate an important tool for keeping human bias in check. Many law enforcement agencies that are using the technology right now and believe it contributes to fair and more effective policing by potentially reducing the impact of human bias among officers, investigators, and even eyewitnesses. Eyewitness testimony is notoriously uh, error prone. Considering that you know, the research shows that high quality facial recognition uh, can identify individuals more accurately than most people can unassisted by technology, banning all the tech facial recognition would eliminate an important tool for checking and mitigating human bias. I do want to say that using accurate technology in all these cases matters. Only the highest performing technology should be used, uh, high, high performing across demographic groups, especially for government applications. Last year, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology conducted the most extensive and scientifically sound research so far on the issue. And it's important that you know that it found no variation among demographic uh, groups in the highest performing technologies. It evaluated over 200 algorithms. The highest performing ones showed no demographic variation. And these are the same technologies that are used in the Maryland system that we were talking about earlier and many of the law enforcement systems throughout the country. Much of the attention is focused instead on the very lowest performing technologies uh, that were mentioned earlier, where there is an issue. Some of the lower performing technologies do not perform evenly across demographic groups. That's a problem. That's an issue that industry is working to address. But it's not true to say that technology is less accurate across the board for minority groups, or that's the current state of the technology. And no, uh, no, no disrespect to, to Ms. Falawami, but um, this MIT uh, research that has been referenced here has been widely misconstrued as having evaluated facial recognition technology, when in fact- oh, I, I'm very clear fact, it's gender classification. Is, I'm very clear it's gender classification. That, that was not, you did not evaluate facial recognition technology. That was from Assessathon. Right, I evaluate a gender classification, which I make explicit. You're you're not you're not on the committee. You're you're not allowed to do that. So please don't don't interrupt. Go ahead. So my point was that this was called out in the NIST uh, government report that um, this is that is an important issue to look at the demographic uh, variables here, but uh, these are not the same thing. Facial recognition is different from facial analysis technology. And it's being misconstrued, the, the problems of this older, outdated technology that was evaluated in that study. 
Uh, additionally, I'll say earlier, the, uh, it was mentioned that several of the large, you know, powerful technology companies uh, have taken a, a public step away from, from providing this technology to law enforcement, but those announcements are less significant than they might seem. Uh, the specialized facial recognition uh, technology providers in that space uh, uh, have not done that. And uh, I know I'm probably running out of time here, but I will um, see if there's any questions. All right, thank you. Um, if you can go to the next person, uh, next testimony, Richard. And that's it. Uh, Mr. Chair, I did have one question. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. You muted. In your in your testimony, you mentioned that the uh, person arrested for the uh, Gazette uh, yeah. shooting uh, in a, in Anne Arundel County was identified using this technology. Um, is, is what you were referring to uh, the MCAC system that we've already established that the Baltimore Police, Police Department is currently using? Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. How about the next one? Anthony Sommer. You're on, Mr. Sommer. So just to clarify, anybody who's uh, who's an attendee, we're going to call on you if you'd like to uh, testify after you hear um, the beat, or once we call on you, you'll be able to testify. Uh, so go ahead. Can you call that name one more time? Anthony Sommer. He's on mute. <laughs> Hello. Hey, my, I'm Anthony Somerville. Um, I am here on behalf of... Uh, the office of Zika Cohen. I'm an intern. I'm just taking notes. Okay. Okay. Welcome. Antoine Banks, formerly Council Services. No need to testify. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Barbara Zetnik, also former municipal employee. Oh. I'm all good, thank you. All right, now now we have some call-in users. When you hear the beeps, you can speak. Call-in user two. Huh? Call-in user two. Hmm. Okay, we'll come back. Try call-in user four. Oh. And here's call in user four, number four. Okay. Away from the phone, we can come back perhaps. Let's see what else we have. Okay, Frank Boston. Frank Boston, go ahead, please. How do you do? Unmute. Richard, can you unmute him? He's muted. He is unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Boston. Hear you. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and uh, Richard, thank you. I am just here listening. I am not offering testimony. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next. Okay. Okay. Oh, wait, 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 Mr. Okay, Jan uh, Janelle, mommy. Records. And a large number of TCHS babies renew their searches for their history and medical records. But for David's grieving family, there are no records to be found. 
It's as if their son never existed at all. She's not there to testify, yeah, so you can read that. mother's go. memory clears and the family's grief subsides, the more things don't make sense. How could multiple mothers in the same ward receive the same news? How could I also the baby was born in the hospital that that night, the with at least three mothers okay. in the ward on the day Josie remembers, and maybe more, have died so quickly? Okay, next is Jared Council. Jared Council. Uh, yes, I'm a reporter. I don't. I don't have any testimony. I'm just listening in. Uh, Jed Weeks. No comment. Okay. Joe Magar. Just observing, I have no testimony to offer. Okay. Julian Lachance. Hi, can you hear me? Very well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Julian Lachance. I'm a computer vision researcher at Princeton University. Uh, I was not originally intending to speak today, but I was very disturbed by the misrepresentation of information by the former um, tech expert who spoke. And I wanted to speak out in opposition to the use of um, facial surveillance technology and stand in support of Dr. Bola Mwini, who is most certainly uh, a world-renowned expert in this area and in um, algorithmic bias in general. Um, I, I also teach computer vision to students at Princeton University. Um, I also run a, a camp teaching the same type of <laughs> information to high school students. And even when we talk to the high school students, we teach them about the dangers of facial surveillance technology. Um, there's this uh, conception in the general public that these technologies are somehow un unbiased because, um, you know, it's, it's this seemingly empirical algorithm, uh, you know, working with the data. Um, but the fact is that every part of the design of these algorithms is controlled by people in some way. The, the types of data that go into the algorithms can extremely very much bias the results. The way that algorithms are constructed can bias the results. And um, the, the research is very clear that when we use this spatial surveillance technology in the public, the results are overwhelmingly harmful, particularly to communities of color, women, um, different minority groups in general. Um, but the real risk here is that people don't perceive them to be biased systems, which is why they're so immediately used in applications like predictive policing and monitoring the public and so on. And as we see, um, the, the policing system has already been using facial recognition in some way. Um, we're not here really talking about the, the police application of this, but we should be mindful of the impact on the public of having this data just being mindlessly collected and applied by people who would otherwise misconstrue the results in some way. So um, I really just wanted to um, suppress, uh, express my support for the opposition. I really think that it is too dangerous at this point to <laughs> utilize facial surveillance in any way in Baltimore. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to respond to any of those, but um, that's all I had to say on the topic. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Okay. Linda Keeley. Linda Keeley. No, te no testimony. Thank you. M Matthew Boyle. No testimony. Okay. Melissa Bloom. Oh, no, te sorry, no testimony. Okay, Phil, Phil Davis, Phil Davis. If you can actually hear me, or you already commented in the chat. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Shauna, Shauna Potter. No testimony for this. Thank you. See you well low. See you well low. All right, she she works for me. Uh, she's just here listening in and taking notes. That's everybody I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Um, Councilman Burnett, um, it's your bill. Would you like to um, would you like to make a motion, or would you like to hold it over and uh, work through some of the uh, some of the things that we discovered tonight? Make it the motion. Uh, I'd I'd like to move. First, I'd like to move the amendments that the law department uh, has asked to, to clarify government agency. Uh, so I, I'd make a motion to move the law department's amendments. Second. Second by Councilman Cohn. Okay. You want to roll call, Mr. Chair? All in favor. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, the eyes have it. Um, the amendments, uh, the, the law department's amendments are approved. Councilman Burnett. Chair, I'd like to move the bill as amended. Okay. Second. Okay, Richard, we'll do a roll call. I'm sorry, who, where was the second from, Mr. Chair? Councilman Cohn. Thank you, sir. Okay, roll call. Ch Chairman Schleifer. Sorry. You, you're muted, Mr. Chair. I'm not muted. Okay, we. Well, I did said no. No. Chair Schleifer votes no. Vice Chair Burnett. Yes. Vice Chair Burnett votes aye. Mr. Cowan. Yes. Mr. Cowan votes aye. Member McRae. No. Mr. McRae votes no. Mr. Pankett. Mr. Chair, can I explain my vote? <laughs> um, I think it's been made clear that um, um, this new wave of facial um, recognition um, should be um, a road that um, if we go down, we should go down with much caution. Um, for all of the reasons that have been laid out as it relates to the studies and the testimonies that we've heard tonight. Um, one thing that I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed about um, as a course of this hearing, the discrepancy between our law department and the police department over how this bill impacts um, this key agency of the, of the city. Um, and I think that for me, it, it challenges my my vote because um, it seems as though we are in agreement that the police department should be able to use the tools that they're currently using, but it's not clear whether this bill allows them or prevents them from continuing to use that tool. So until we make until we decide and make that clear, um, at this point, I have to vote no. Mr. Pinkett votes no. Member Sneed. Um, yes, I'm 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 here. Um and I'm really on the fence with this bill because I understand what the um bill sponsor is intended to do. Um I'm just not clear on um, some of the questions that I asked, um, even the police department in terms of what's the numbers that we are ready, that we have, what's coming back. It, it seems like we don't have enough information. Um, and so I would prefer that um, if this is going to be about whether we trust police to do the right thing, I feel like we need to go back um, and make some amendments and work with the state on this. Um, I, I'm just unsure. And so, um, for this, I'm just, uh, gosh, um, cause I really, I really understand what the response is, is going to do. And so I'm, 
I'm going to vote yes, hoping that the sponsor will work with the state and get everything that he needs to get done to make this a um, a bill with like really no consequences. Member Sneed votes aye. Mr. Chair, three, three votes in the affirmative, three negative, so the uh, motion is not agreed to. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you for. Um, everybody who testified.